welcome to Rooted Fellowship, or what we refer to as Rooted Digital. My name is Pinky Mukwena, and I have the pleasure of facilitating how we're going to be spending our time together this morning. It's such a delight to know that we can still connect as a church, even in these new times, right? Um, sending lots of love to all you regular members and a special welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. We always say that Rooted Fellowship is about three things. And these three things are that we are gospel-centered, we are disciple-making, as well as transcultural. By gospel-centered, what we mean is that we believe in a life that is centered and saturated around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ, affirming him as Lord and Savior. By disciple-making, what we mean is that we believe that as the gospel transforms the individual life of a person, we want to see a multiplying effect of that in the lives of others. And we believe that this happens best through the making of disciples. Last but not least, in transcultural, what we believe is in a view of community that reflects, embraces, and even enjoys the diversity of its context, and by the power of the gospel, transcends it and creates one new community in Christ. Prayer is one of those things that are very significant um, in our church. And so even in this, these times, we would like to incorporate, or we've incorporated rather, a space and an opportunity for us to pray together. And um, in the next few minutes, we'll show up a slide of all the prayer requests or prayer items that we'll be lifting up to God in this week. And so I'd like to encourage you as well that if there's anything else that you feel the Holy Spirit is pressing on your heart, Lift it up to God as well in prayer. Let me lead us in that. Thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you, Lord, that even in the newness of the season, that, Father, you are never phased or baffled. We thank you, Lord, that we get to pray together. And, Lord, as we pray, Father God, we're trusting you with everything that we're lifting up to you. We thank you that you are a God of wonder. You are God who is all-powerful and almighty. In the holy name of Jesus, we thank you.
Die.
psalmist once said that the Lord lives among the praises of his people and so what a joy it is this morning to get to worship him together affirming that truth I'd like to share with you a portion of scripture this morning from the book of Habakkuk um, from verse 17 chapter 3 verse 17 rather it reads though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit Though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. Amen. So we know that Jesus Christ is the most generous person that's ever lived. And how do we know this? because he gave his life so that we may live in him. As Christians, we offer up our gifts as a sign of having received the greatest gift ever. And that was, of course, Jesus. The gospel encourages and compels us to give with a joyful heart. As we give, 
This helps others meet Jesus and grow in their relationship with Him. But not only that, it also helps us as a church provide for material and emotional needs inside and outside the church. As we prepare our hearts to give this morning, let's say this generosity prayer together. Generous Father, thank you that all things were created through you and for you. You are before all things and in you all things exist. The Bible says that we should bring our tithes and offerings into your storehouses and that you will respond by opening the windows of heaven and send down blessing upon blessing. Accept the gifts we place before you this morning. May the peace of God reign in our lives, the love of God surround us, the Spirit of God empower us, and the joy of the Lord uphold us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's get ready for the reading of the Word of God together this morning by heading on over there. Hey everyone, my name is Ane Mokhatli. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors at Rooted Fellowship. If you're a first time guest with us, on behalf of the Rooted family, I want to welcome you. We are so thankful that you would take this time uh, to journey with us as we navigate through the scriptures, unpacking who Jesus is and what that means for our lives today. We're going to pick up from where we left off last week. We saw Jesus having just healed a man with a paralyzed hand and he did this in the presence of the pharisees now instead of the pharisees marveling at what jesus had done they begin to plan to kill him we see this in mark chapter 3 verse 6 where it says immediately the pharisees went out and started plotting with the herodians against him how they might kill him now mark then just moves on to the next scene uh, and so to keep in the same theme as Mark, we're going to do that very same thing. But we're going to pause at a few places just to unpack some of the golden nuggets that are found in this text. And so if you have a Bible, meet me in Mark chapter 3. And we're going to be reading from verse 7. It reads as follows. Jesus departed with his disciples to the sea. And a large crowd followed from Galilee. And a large crowd followed from Judea, Jerusalem. Edumea, beyond the Jordan, and around Turos and Sidon. The large crowd came to him because they heard about everything he was doing. Not what he was saying, but what he was doing. Now, it's important to take note of that. We'll come back to it in a moment. Verse 9. Then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him. Since he had healed many, all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. This speaks to Jesus' authority over the unclean spirits. It speaks to Jesus' power. Verse 12, And he would strongly warn them not to make him known. Mark then uh, transitions from this scene to the very next. He says in verse 13, Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 whom he also named apostles, apostles, apostles. This word apostles is one that in our context, I believe, has been abused. But I believe that apostles no longer exist Today, that anyone who would refer to themselves as an apostle has self-appointed themselves as an apostle. And here's why. In the New Testament, the uh, word apostle is given to those who, who were with Jesus. They were his disciples in his very presence. And they were given a specific, unique responsibility. And that was to lay the foundation of the church. And Jesus was to be the cornerstone. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. And so this was a unique responsibility. One that no longer exists today. Why? Because we don't need to lay down any more foundation. That everything that we need as a foundation has been given to us 
in the scriptures. And so if someone is trying to lay a new foundation, well, then the Bible tells us that that person is incorrect. They are against the very scriptures. And so the the unique office of an apostle no longer exists, though the gift of an apostle, one who is sent out, I believe that that exists today. Not the office, but the gift. And so to not confuse it with the office, I prefer using a different word that also starts with the letter A, and that is an ambassador. That that for those who are in Christ, we are ambassadors. We have been sent out to put on display the kingdom of God, not to lay down new foundation that is very different to what the apostles here were meant to do, but we're meant to put on display the kingdom of God and to see the church grow. And so here Jesus refers to them as apostles. Let's read verse 14 again. He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him, to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. He appointed the 12 to Simon. He gave the name Peter and to James, the son of Zebedee, and to his brother John. He gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of Thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Helphios, and Thaddaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And then that's the story. Before Mark moves on to the next scene, I think we should kind of go back and, and slow things down a little bit. We should go a little bit deeper so that we can see what Mark wants us to see. And, and not just see, but that we might learn. And not just learn, but that we might apply. And so if I was to title our message today, if I had uh, this one point that I wanted to give you today, it would be this. Mark wants us to not just be part of the crowd. He wants us to be part of Christ. That we're not to be just part of the crowd. We are to be part of of Christ. Why? Why is that important? I'm glad you asked. It's because that is where the great miracle occurs. If you're looking for a miracle, it happens when we are a part of Christ. See, we're told that the crowds were coming to Jesus because of what he was doing. Not what he was saying, but what he was doing. You see, they were drawn to the power of Jesus and not necessarily to the person of Jesus. Now, to be clear, when you get the person of Jesus, you also get the power of Jesus. But it is very possible to experience the power of Jesus and completely miss the person of Jesus. I can hear someone going, uh, could you say that one more time, Pastor? Sure. So I'll repeat it. See, they were drawn to the power of Jesus and not necessarily to the person of Jesus. And and I want to be clear, I've said it before, but let me say it again. That when you get the person of Jesus, you also get the power of Jesus. You cannot separate the two. But it is very possible, very, very possible to experience the power of Jesus and yet completely miss the person of Jesus. And so let's let's slow this down even more because you might be going on and it sounds confusing are you trying to trick me no but so let's slow it down a little bit and and unpack what i mean by this verse 9 then he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him so that the crowd wouldn't crush him since he had healed many all who had diseases were pressing toward him to touch him whenever the unclean spirits saw him They fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. Now, look, miracles are are great. And to be honest, we all want them. I, I want them. But we must put them in their correct place. We must. We must put them in their correct place. And that is, they are meant to point us to the miracle maker. The miracles of Jesus were performed as signs to testify to his unique identity. That that is why they were given to us. 
Now let's look at the text again. The, the, the miracle of healing the diseases. This, this amazing miracle. Who bows? T take a look at the text. Who, who bows? The, the, this beautiful, amazing miracle that occurs. Who bows? Who acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God? The crowd missed Jesus. Just like the Pharisees missed Jesus. It, it, we're told that, that it's the unclean spirits upon seeing Jesus for who he is, then declare that you are the Son of God. Not, not those who had just experienced the healing. Nowhere in the text are we told that they are the ones who bowed and called on Jesus as the Son of God. They missed Jesus. See, it's wonderful for people to be attracted to Jesus. But if their focus is on what he can do for them instead of who he is, they will not follow him for long. This is something that we see quite often, that, that people are drawn to Jesus because of the miracles that he performs and yet completely miss him as the Son of God. So how do I, how do we ensure that we are not a part of the crowd? How do we ensure that, that we aren't just there because of what Jesus can, can do, the miracles that he can do for us? How do we ensure that we are more than just the crowd? Well, we come to Christ for Christ. I know it sounds too simple, but, but it is. We come to Christ for Christ. Not for the miracles, but for Christ. And this coming is by way of invitation. Jesus invites you. That's how you come to Christ. He invites you. He initiates this relationship by grace and by love. Now you might ask the question, how do I know that he has invited me? How do I know? How do I know that he has invited me? Well, this very moment communicates this. This very moment declares that you have been invited. The fact that you are hearing the very word of God is an invitation. That someone maybe shares Jesus with you, that is an invitation. That someone is praying for you, that is an invitation. That God so loved the world is an invitation. That he gave his one and only son is an invitation. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That is an invitation. Now, now you might be sitting and going, okay, on a, I, I, I get it, right? It sounds super simple, but, but I think I get it. My question to you would be, do you? Do you really get it? Do you really understand? Because I didn't. For many years, I didn't. For many years, Jesus was an irritation to me, just like the Pharisees, and I completely missed him. Maybe for some of you, Jesus was just a genie in a bottle, and you missed him. He was just an ATM, and you missed him. He was just that, 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 that person that I go to when I need something. And so you missed him. But you know that moment. If you're a Christian today, if you've crossed the line of faith, you know that moment where you saw Jesus as the invitation to God the Father. When life radically changed for you. When it wasn't just about, about getting the miracle. But it was now recognizing that you get Jesus. And so you came to Christ. The invitation is put out even today, even in this moment. Come to Christ. See, Jesus called out and they came to him. That's what the text says to us. He called them out and they came to him. Mark then tells us to be with him. Come to him and then be with him. We see this in verse 14. He appointed 
12, whom he also named apostles, to be with him. You come to Jesus to be with Jesus. When you become a Christian, you get Christ. I mean, it couldn't be more obvious. Christian, you get Christ. And friends, this is not just the greatest miracle. This is the miracle. It's the miracle. That Jesus, the creator and the sustainer of the world, would come down from heaven, live among his creation, live the life that you and I should have lived, died the excruciating death that you and I deserved, resurrected, ascended, is now seated in his rightful place at the right hand of God. That this secures for us everlasting life, that we become co-heirs with him, that we share in his glory. That we are in him and he is in us. We get Christ. That is the greatest miracle. That we get to be with him. And so to follow Christ means to be with him wherever he goes. Which means if he goes to some dark places, then we go to some dark places. If he goes to places of suffering, then we go to places of suffering. And that we rejoice when we are with him because there is no better place there is no better place to be than to be with christ because wherever he is there is security that you will be okay and so we get christ i want us to to let that sink in for a moment the fact that we get christ We get Christ. To follow Jesus simply means to follow Jesus. It couldn't be more clear. And friends, this should never get old. It should never get old. Maybe you've been walking with Jesus for a while, for a season now. The temptation is that some of the stuff would just become old. It would become too obvious. But this should never get old. This is why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3 verse 1. When he talks about the priceless value of knowing Christ. Here's what he says. Whatever happens my dear brothers and sisters. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. He says I never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. I never get tired of telling you these things that I I want to, in a sense, tell you the same thing over and over and over again. Rejoice because you get Christ. Follow Jesus. Be where he is. Don't just be a part of the crowd. Be part of Christ. This never gets old. But the second thing that Mark tells us that separates us from being the crowd is that Jesus gives us a cause. He gives us a cause. So we not only get Christ, but we are also given a cause. This is what separates us from just being part of the crowd. Jesus called them to send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Here in Mark chapter 3, we get a trailer attraction to the Great Commission that is found in Mark chapter 16. And so let me read you the fuller version in Mark 16 from verse 15 to 18. It says, Then he said to them, this is the Great Commission, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes. They, will, they should drink anything deadly. If they drink anything deadly, they, it will not harm them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will get well. See, friends, the, the, the cause that we are given is the commission. And that commission is to make disciples. And this commission is a command, not a suggestion. It does not stop, not for the busy work schedule, not for the crazy academic 
degree, not even in a global pandemic. This great commission continues and it is given to us. Those who are part of Christ, we are given this commission. See, the, the rhythm may adjust, uh, the rhythm of making disciples, it may adjust depending on the season, but we never turn the music off. Because I know, I know some people would say, well, oh, no, you just don't understand. You, you don't understand the, the season that I'm in. And I go, no, 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 I get you. The rhythm changes. But just make sure you never turn the music off. But the Great Commission continues. The making of disciples should become a way of life. But we'll unpack this commission when we get to Mark chapter 16 in a couple of weeks. But for now, let me make some quick remarks. Some quick observations about this Great Commission according to Mark. And that is we receive two promises. For those who are obedient to this beautiful, great cause, we are then given two promises. The first promise is the promise of salvation and a warning. The promise of salvation and a warning. That if they believe, they will be saved. Salvation. And if they don't, then they will be judged. The warning. The second promise that we get from being obedient to this commission is the promise of heavenly power and protection. The promise of heavenly power and protection. The signs that will accompany the making of disciples. He, he lays it out in Mark chapter 16 that there will be so many signs that we will receive and we will also be protected. And so our cause is to get more people to know Christ. That's our cause. Is to get more people to know Christ. In the same way that we know Christ, we're saying we want more people to know Christ. And this cause is not just for the formally theologically educated. It's not just for the missionary who goes off to Asia or Europe. It's for all who know Christ. And so if you've crossed the line of faith, you've been given this great cause. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've been given this great cause. And we're to put on display the beautiful kingdom of God, that we, we should have this burning desire for people to know who Jesus is and that we're to do this wherever we live, work, or play, that we are on mission. And again, this separates us from just being a part of the crowd. The crowd comes and gets and then they go. No, we come, we get Christ, and then we are put on mission. And so we get Christ we are given a cause. And then lastly, we are placed in community. You want to know if you are not just part of a crowd, but you're part of Christ? Is that you get placed in community. Verse 16, he appointed the twelve. To Simon he gave the name Peter. And to James, the son of Zebedee. And to his brother John, he gave the name Boanerges. That is, sons of thunder. Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew, Matthew, and Thomas, James, the son of Helphios, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. Man, these are some crazy names, right? Some crazy names, but they're in the Bible, and so we read them. He places them into a community, these 12. He puts them together, and what a community. Simon, who later becomes Peter. Peter, who always seems to get it wrong. That's the, that's the Peter we're talking about here. But before we bash Peter too quickly, I believe that, that, that Peter was just the leader who, in a sense, was just representing his community. And so, you know, Jesus would say something uh, and the disciples would get together and talk about it. And then he would come and go, uh, well, Jesus, um, we've been chatting and, and we think that maybe a better way to do it. Oh, uh oh, Or maybe he would come and say, well, you know, Jesus, I hear you on that point. Uh, but me and the guys have been in a little debate and, and here's our point of view. And we actually think it's better than yours. Uh oh, I mean, that was, that was Peter. He, he always got it wrong. We also see two brothers who Jesus calls the sons of thunder. Why the sons of thunder? Well, the Bible doesn't uh, really tell us why. In fact, this is the only place where we see it. 
But I believe it's because James and John had thunder-like qualities, that they had a, a, a kind of a fiery nature. I believe this because in Luke chapter 9, uh, Jesus and his disciples were traveling through Samaria on their way to Jerusalem, and they ran into some trouble. Jesus attempted to find some accommodation uh, for one night, uh, but was met with some opposition from the villagers, um, simply because uh, that he was a Jew and they were Samaritans, and they just didn't get along. And so folks were just kind of like, nah, we don't want you guys in our space. But notice how James and John respond to that. They say to Jesus, Luke 9 verse 54, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven to burn them up? I mean, that's, that is fiery, man. That is a thunder-like character. And so obviously Jesus rebukes them and says, guys, hold on. It's not that serious. We'll just go to another village. They had a fiery personality. We also see Matthew, the tax collector, who's part of this community. Now, being a tax collector back then wasn't like working at uh, SARS today or, or some uh, tax uh, collection service uh, place. No, 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 it was very different. If you were a tax collector back then, it meant that you were taking money from your own people on behalf of the Roman Empire, because that's who was in charge. The, much of the known world had been colonized by the Roman Empire. And so you were taking tax from your own people to give to the Romans. This was seen as one of the greatest betrayals. And yet Jesus picks a tax collector and brings him into the community. Uh, we also see... In that community is Simon the Zealot. Now, uh, uh, Zealots back then were part of a group. Uh, they were Jewish, but they were part of a group uh, that opposed, radically opposed the Roman Empire. And so, and so they hated anyone who, who was friendly to the Romans, and they definitely hated the Romans. In fact, uh, there was a, a more radicalized group uh, who were part of the Zealots, um, and they were known as the Dagger Men because they carried small little daggers, and when no one was looking uh, and they found an opportunity to do so, they would stab uh, the Romans or those who were friends with the Romans. And so these, these individuals were, were very, very radical, and, and yet Jesus invites Matthew, the tax collector, and then brings in Simon the Zealot, and he says, hey guys, I want us to be part of a community. I mean, I can imagine the dinners when it's time to pray. And Matthew's just like, I, I'm, I'm, not open. I'm not closing my eyes. My eyes are wide open. I'm staring straight at Simon. I'm not taking my eyes off you because I know how this is going to end. And Jesus says, no, you're going to be a part of the same community. Now, it's important for us to see that Jesus, Jesus calls us into a community, but we don't always pick our community. We don't pick who is part of our community. And yet today, that's what we want to do. It's so much easier to handpick, I'll take them and them. Why? Because they like me. It's a lot easier to vibe with them. Jesus says, no, I'll, I'll pick the community and I'll place you in that community. I think of my siblings. Um, I'm the oldest of three. I have a younger sister and a younger brother. And I was old enough uh, to, to know that something was changing when they came home. Uh, particularly my younger brother, who I love dearly today. But, but I remember it was pretty rough for me to go, you're, you're bringing a new addition? I mean, sure, sh surely not. Can, can you not see? Are we not a handful? There's two of us. And I'm thankful that, you know, they, they brought him home because he turned out to be a great brother, but, but, but I didn't get to pick who lives in my father's house. And neither do we. That the church belongs to God and we don't pick who's in or who's out. Jesus does that and then he, he just places us in that community. 
And so we get called into this community, this community that becomes the church. He places us there. And he places us there for purpose. It's in that place where we grow. It's in that place where we are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. It's in that place where we become more and more like Jesus. And so to not be a part of the crowd means that you get Christ. He then gives you a cause and then he then places you in a community. See, a disciple, unlike the crowd, is someone who is with Christ. And that person is on a common cause. And that individual is in community. And so Mark wants us to see that. He wants us to be clear about it. He doesn't want us to drift into the crowd, but he wants us to follow Jesus. And so I want to leave you with three questions. As we ponder on this, I want to leave us with three questions. Questions that you can ask yourself every day. In fact, you should. You should ask yourself these three questions every day. Question number one is, have you been with Jesus today? If you call yourself a Christian, the question is, have you been with Jesus today? Have you spent time in his word? Have you, have you sat before him and prayed? Have you been with Jesus? Now, you might be watching this or listening to this and you're going, I, I don't think that's ever happened. I want you to know that the invitation has been made to you. That Christ himself is inviting you to come and be with him. He's initiating this relationship. And he wants to be in it. He longs to be in it. He desires to be in a relationship with you. And so maybe today is the day that you take that step towards him. That you become a part of Christ, that you move from just being the crowd, you take that step towards him. Have you been with Jesus today? My second question in light of our passage today is, is the Great Commission evident in your life? Is the Great Commission evident in your life? Who is discipling you? And then who are you discipling? Now, I know some of you might go, well, man, I don't know if I should be discipling anyone because I'm not 100% sure what discipleship is. And that's perfectly okay. Because the first step is to be discipled. And so if you have crossed the line of faith, you've, you've given your life to Jesus and you're just going, man, I don't know if I've been discipled. We invite you uh, to sign up, to, to send an email to, to community at Rooted Fellowship. And we'd love to get you plugged into a discipleship group. So that you might grow and, and understand what it means to, to, to follow Jesus and to grow in your relationship with Jesus. And not just that, but the ability to share Jesus with others and then to teach others about Jesus. So that they might grow in their relationship with him. Is the Great Commission evident in your life? And then the last question is, who is your community? Who is your community? See, we were never designed to live in isolation. God created us. He beautifully designed us for fellowship. And so who is your community? And I'm not just talking about your blood family, though your community may include that. I'm talking about your blood-bought family. Because that is who you will be with throughout eternity. And so who is your community? Who, who are those people that you can be completely vulnerable with? That, that you can say, hey guys, he, he, here's my life. Here's where I'm at. Here are my shortcomings. Here's my guilt. Here's my shame. Here's my bitterness, my anger. Here's my sin. So that they might point you to the one who forgives you of all of that and seeks to restore you. We need community. We cannot live on our own. We've got to stop pretending that everything is okay and just show up to that community and say, here I am. 
remind me of the fact that I'm in desperate need of a savior. And so who is your community? And are you pouring into your community? Are you leaning into your community? I think of Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 33. Jesus finds himself teaching uh, and his uh, mother and brothers come, standing outside, they're wanting to speak to him. And so um, there's a massive crowd and, and, uh, and people go to Jesus and say, hey, your mother and, and brothers are, and sisters are, are outside looking for you. Jesus then replies, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. And what is the will of God? To know him and to love him. And we do that through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then it's to love others. It's to share Jesus with others. Trusting and believing that they will come to faith. And then it's to disciple them, to establish them in their faith, to equip them in the gospel so that they might go out to make more disciples. That is the will of God. And so Jesus says, anyone who does the will of my father, they are a part of my family. And so if you are in the will of God, doing the will of God, seeking God, seeking to love those around you in the name of Jesus, then, then we're family. We're part of his blood-bought family. And so Jesus invites you to be a part of that. And so I'm going to pray in a moment. But as I pray, I want you to think about your life. I want you to think about where you are. That if you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus, that now is an opportunity to do that, that Jesus invites you to do so. Trust him. Believe in him. That what he has on offer is far better than anything else that has been promised to you. And if you have crossed the line of faith, but, but maybe have been living in disobedience, you, you haven't been making disciples, you haven't been seeking to be disciples, you're not in community. You're living in isolation, making your own decisions on your own path. I want to invite you to come back to Jesus, to listen to the Holy Spirit who's calling you to come back to Jesus. Because to follow Jesus simply means to follow Jesus. And he invites us to do so. And so let's pray. So Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come into your word and to understand what it means simply because the Holy Spirit has given us enlightenment. Father, I pray for those who are listening or watching in this moment, Lord, I pray that you would be working in their hearts, that you would reveal yourself to them, that they would see you for who you are, that they would be drawn to the person of Christ and not just the power of Christ. Lord, I pray that we would not be distracted by the signs and miracles. Lord, you do those because you want them to point to you and to help us to see that which they point to, and that is you seated on your throne. Lord, I pray for those who have crossed the line of faith. Lord, I pray uh, that they would be obedient to the Great Commission, that they would desire to go and make disciples who go on to make more disciples. And then, Lord, I pray for folks to really, really dive into community. To recognize that they were never meant to live on their own. That the evil one's desire is to sow the seed that we are by ourselves. That no one cares. Lord, I pray that you would keep the evil one at bay. That you would block him out and that we would hear from you through your word. And so Lord, would you save many? Would you draw many to yourself? We love you. We praise you and we long for your return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
majesty Covered by your grace so free And here I am Knowing I'm a sinful man Covered by the blood of the Lamb Now i found The greatest love of all It is mine Since you laid down your life The greatest sacrifice Sin majesty Your grace has found me just as I am Empty-handed but alive in your hands Here I am Humbled by the love that you give Forgiven so that I can forgive And here I stand Knowing that I'm your desire Sanctified by glory and fire And now I've found The greatest love of all is mine since you laid down your life the greatest sacrifice we're singing majesty majesty your grace has found me just as I am Empty-handed but alive in your hands We're singing majesty Majesty Forever I am changed by your love In the presence of your majesty Grace has found me just as I am Empty-handed but alive in your hands We're singing majesty Majesty Forever I am changed by your love in the presence of your majesty We're so thankful for the sharing of God's word this morning. Amen and amen. Was it your first time hearing the word this morning? If so, we'd like to hear from you. Send us an email on community at rooted.com. Similarly, if you'd like for us to pray with you, or if you'd like to be plugged in to either a city group, a discipleship group, or a huddle, send us an email on the same email address, community at At the end of this video, there's going to be a slide with all the connection platforms that you can connect with us, um, either through social media and other. So be on the lookout for that. As always, or every week at Rooted Fellowship, we normally close our time together through the reading of a benediction. Benediction is a word that's made up of two words, bene, which means good, and diction, which means word. So, a good word. This morning's good word is going to be read from the book of Jude, um, verses 24 and 25. 
to him who is able to keep you from falling and present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. See you next week.